Good evening, and thank you for joining us today for this Victor's Go Virtual event. My name is Tony Wagoner, and I am the Chief Development Officer for the UM School of Public Health. Until recently, I was a gift officer at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. The purpose of our conversation today is to discuss the role of the School of Public Health in providing expertise to the state of Michigan, the university, and many other organizations throughout the coronavirus pandemic. During the next hour, we will hear from Dean Du Bois Bowman and other faculty leaders from Michigan Public Health. Before I introduce one of our special guests, I have some housekeeping items for our event this evening. Live captioning is available during today's program. To view captions, please click on closed caption at the bottom right of your screen and then choose show subtitle. To use the Q&A feature, please type your question in the Q&A window at any time during the event. To begin our time together, it is my great pleasure to introduce Nicole Rubin. Nicole is a 1995 graduate of the UM School of Public Health with a Master of Health Services Administration degree. Nicole has dedicated her career to making an impact on the health and well-being of humankind as a leader in the nonprofit and healthcare sectors. She has spent the last decade working as a consultant for Ronald McDonald House Charities Global, leading their global research initiative on family-centered care and serving as a program officer for their maternal and child health global grants program. She has worked in leadership roles for global nonprofits such as R. MHC and Susan Komen for the cure. She has also worked in large academic medical centers such as Methodist Health Healthcare in Houston and the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. Nicole has served on the Dean's Advisory Board for the School of Public Health since 2014 and was awarded the John H. Romani Award from the school in 2013 for her leadership in public health administration and for her commitment to the ideals of public health. We are so fortunate to have her as part of the Michigan family. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Tony. I'm so pleased we could bring this group together. And, um, and so what drew me to public health originally was the desire to make an impact on improving health at both the community and society level. And it's clear there has never been a more important time for public health. Michigan gave me the training, skills, and perspective to lead on issues relating to health and I'm forever indebted to this school, not only for what it taught me, but for the extraordinary lead group of leaders and best it has produced for decades and who are providing critical leadership during these times. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Du Bois Bowman, Dean of the U of M School of Public Health. In addition to leading one of the nation's premier public health programs, Dean Bowman is a renowned expert in statistical analysis of brain imaging data, his work mines massive data sets and has important implications for mental and neurological disorders and brain health. Prior to joining U of M School of Public Health, Dr. Bowman served as chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Faculty Leadership at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and Emory University and was founding director of Emory Center for Biomedical Imaging Statistics. In addition to his renowned research, Dr. Bowman is an alumnus of the University of Michigan, one of our very own leaders in best. He's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, a sought out advisor for research on diversity and inclusion, and most recently served a primary role in advising the state and the University of Michigan in shaping its COVID-19 pandemic response. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Du Bois Bowman. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, and thank you, Nicole, for your gracious introduction and also for being a, a tremendous supporter of, of the school and the University of Michigan. It's my pleasure to be with all of you tonight. I have the distinct honor of serving as the Dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Although it's been just a little over 18 months since I've been enrolled, the, the flurry of activity that we've experienced in 2020 uh, on many days make it, makes it feel like I've been enrolled for, for decades. 
over the last four months, our world has uh, changed in very, very fundamental ways. And there's been a devastating loss of life and financial hardships, especially among the most vulnerable. Since February, our faculty, staff, uh, students, and alumni have been part of massive campus-wide, statewide, national, and, and even in some instances, global uh, response to the, to the coronavirus pandemic. The slide that you see on the screen is a visual representation of our COVID-specific engagement and response. And I won't cover the, the detail, but our work has contributed to deliver to government, uh, to various types of public engagement and outreach, to students, to this private sector, and even um, uh, providing leadership locally at the University of Michigan. The breadth and depth of our work is in service to local communities and to populations worldwide. And on campus, I've been leading a group of public health and Michigan medicine faculty to plan for a public health informed in-person fall semester. I'll talk a little bit more about this work later in tonight's program, uh, but this work includes recommendations for testing, containment, uh, and monitoring for, for COVID-19. Locally, we have alumni serving on the front lines of county health departments and playing uh, key roles at the state level in their work to protect the health and safety of their uh, respective communities has been simply remarkable. And our, our reach is also international, as, as alluded to earlier. We have faculty, uh, particularly some faculty in the Department of Biostatistics, who provided predictive case count models that have actually aided the governmental response in India. However, expansive our efforts, we still remain in the midst of a very, very challenging public health crisis. And it's evident that COVID-19 has also intersected with uh, deeply invasive systematic racism uh, giving rise to broad uh, health inequities. And COVID-19 has disproportionately affected uh, black and brown lives while our nation also uh, simultaneously mourns devastating losses of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Rayshard Brooks, and, and, and others. And unlike SARS-CoV-2, which is the, the novel biologic agent that causes COVID-19, racism and racial violence are, are not new. And at the School of Public Health, it's our mission to relentlessly pursue a healthier and more equitable world for all. And, and I stress, you know, not just for some, but for all. And I urge you to consider that our work in public health is now more important than ever. The, the current crisis before us has, has challenged the idea that our public health systems are adequately developed and resourced and exposed deep needs across those systems. And although challenging, it's our responsibility and privilege at the School of Public Health to continually prevent uh, the health challenges that we can predict as well as to prepare for those that we cannot. And, and the way to do this is that we must invest in really foundational strength, which with, will then allow uh, for agility as we confront future health and equity issues. And so what this means is we have to train more future public health leaders uh, to meet the dynamic and shifting landscape of health and equity. We must fund innovative research that focuses on prevention and preparedness uh, to, to help our healthcare system avoid costly treatments and response downstream. And most importantly, we must translate our, our evidence-based work into real-time uh, interventions and service to populations worldwide. And again, especially with the focus on the most vulnerable uh, among us. Our actions as scientific researchers and advocates alone will, will not alleviate the broad effects of this pandemic or any future 
public health crisis. We need support from government, from nonprofit and community organizations and the, and the private sector. We also need support from the general public, and that's from me, from you, our respective families and friends and, and, and colleagues. Disease outbreaks happen all the time. The threat of uh, more serious pandemics uh, is, is always looming, but the coronavirus pandemic has vividly exposed our, our deep need for, for public health and built uh, that's built on a robust infrastructure of research, practice, teaching, and communication to ensure our, our preparedness. We need for public health to be at its best so that the next pandemic is less severe, even I would say subsequent waves of, of this pandemic, uh, and so that the health disparities that we live with every day become a thing of the past sooner rather than later. And it's with this last point that I'd like to introduce you to three really, really, really world-class uh, Michigan public health faculty. Since early March, a team of nine interdisciplinary faculty from the School of Public Health has been working closely with public health officials and policymakers to provide public health modeling, guidance, and expertise uh, to help state leaders make informed decisions. The School of Public Health partnering with, at the state level, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. And then within the university, partnering with the School of Information and the College of Engineering. And we've worked together to develop and implement a precision population health strategy for the state of Michigan, uh, including publicly available online or digital tools that support the state's uh, return to work. You'll hear more about this critical work in, in, in just a few moments, but I'd like to transition into introducing the esteemed panel. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Martin. Dr. Martin is an associate professor of epidemiology. She co-directs the CDC-funded influenza vaccine effectiveness surveillance efforts, efforts for uh, the state of Michigan. She'll discuss some of the real-time epidemiologic data used to monitor the spread of COVID-19 in the state of Michigan. After uh, Dr. Martin, you'll hear from uh, the Millicent Higgins Collegiate Professor of Epidemiology, Dr. Sharon Cardia. Dr. Cardia is an epidemiologist and human geneticist. She also serves as Associate Dean of Education at the School of Public Health. And she spent the last three months working in partnership with the state to help guide a safe uh, and public health informed re-engagement strategy using a, a precision population health approach. And then finally, you'll hear uh, about risk mitigation in the workplace from Dr. Rick Neitzel. Dr. Neitzel is an associate professor of environmental health sciences. He's an exposure scientist whose work focuses on health effects associated with various occupational and community exposures. And, and before turning, turning it over, I'd also just like to give a brief public thanks to these three faculty and the other faculty who have supported them in their efforts. Uh, you can imagine how busy the past four months have been and every time a new opportunity comes to my attention where it's important that uh, there's a critical need, perhaps even uh, lives depend on the guidance that we provide. You know, I, I, I go to the team and when it's not clear where the bandwidth has, will come from, they've all uh, certainly been willing to, to, to figure out how to expand they're, they're already full bandwidth to, to deliver. So with that, I'd like to, to, to thank all of them and then to turn it over uh, to Dr. Martin. Great, thank you very much. So I'm gonna start by uh, talking a little bit about introducing the concept of precision public health um, before we launch into the epidemiologic data. So many of you have probably heard the term precision medicine. Today we're gonna to talk about precision public health. Similar concept, but with some unique qualities that are gonna help us manage the coronavirus pandemic now and going forward in a way that has some kind of refinement and precision. So 
Uh, precision medicine is about delivering the right treatment at the right time to the right patient. Precision public health, in comparison, is focused on having the right information at the right time about the right place to make the best decision to improve the public's health and to use the best strategies going forward. So for a patient, this would involve using big data, maybe genomics or wearable devices or tools in order to pinpoint a patient's needs and tailor the best, uh, the best and most appropriate treatment for that patient. Similarly, here we're going to talk about using real-time epidemiologic data and digital tools in a way that helps us make uh, more precise recommendations for a population. And this is important because, you know, a pandemic like this is, is too big to address with a one-size-fit-all approach. Approach, especially when you've got a situation where the information on the ground is changing daily, sometimes multiple times a day, and science keeps on developing while we are responding. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk deeper about the epidemiologic data that we've got on hand now, uh, the tools that we're building, and the risk mitigation strategies uh, that are being shared by our faculty with policymakers, with communities, with businesses, in an effort to assist in the COVID-19 response. So our, our precision public health um, strategy centers around this idea of real-time monitoring of local epidemic spread. So how do we take real-time data but get the granularity at a regional level to inform local decision making? And then how do we take um, this information to help us respond to outbreaks earlier? Can we use symptom monitoring for hotspot detection and really um, advanced ways of identifying a problem as it's developing as soon as possible? That allows us to respond to that problem before larger measures are needed. And then how do we use that information to inform what risk mitigation strategies for organizations and businesses are going to be helpful to be able to use both behavioral changes and what Dr. Netz will talk about is stacked practices to be able to um, allow everybody to re-engage in a safer way. So uh, what do we know today about the COVID-19 epidemic and the real-time epidemiologic data? So I'm going to just highlight a few major developments that have happened, both um, with data coming from the University of Michigan and data coming internationally that um, inform the kinds of strategies and responses to the pandemic that you might see going forward. So first, I wanted to present this graph here. So, you know, much of this, um, the data sources and the epidemiologic monitoring we're using for precision public health is strengthened by the fact that we have a long track record at the School of Public Health of doing influenza vaccine effectiveness monitoring in Michigan. So at U of M, we're one of five sites of a national network that calculates that yearly influenza vaccine effectiveness number that you might hear about in the press. And in early March, we were able to pivot immediately to become a COVID response network. And so so because we already had thousands of specimens in the freezer from uh, residents in Michigan, residents in other states around the country, we were able to go back and test those specimens to try to figure out um, in, with all the fog of all of the testing complexities, when were, um, when were the viruses actually arriving in different areas of the country? And um, this is a, a figure that I've taken from a work that's under review right now uh, from the CDC using our data where um, we were able to determine that the virus has entered the Seattle area in mid-February, as you may have heard from other reports, and the first signals of the virus in our network uh, arrived in Michigan in early March, um, in concert with when the first uh, hospitalization started being identified in Michigan. What this tells us is that when the virus arrives in an area, there is a very fast and an explosive expansion of the virus that follows. So in Michigan, in the very early days of the epidemic, we had kind of a, a quick introduction and explosion that happened to virus that followed and um, required a really fast response to be able to get that under control. So um, this is some data I'm going to turn to that's um, data from an international source that kind of speaks to this explosive nature of the spread of the virus. So uh, on the left is a picture of a study from a cluster of infections that was tied to a restaurant. And the, the bubble with the yellow highlighting in it, that was the, that was the patient that was, came into the restaurant with the infection. And the other red circles are the other patrons that got infected. As you can see, that one person leads to a lot of other infections. On the 
right, you can see a, um, an outbreak that happened in a workplace. So the blue seats are where everybody that subsequently became infected was sitting in the workplace. So as you can see, an incredible amount of spread can happen in a very short amount of time. However, this, when I look at these figures, I also see a reason for optimism and I also see a role for prevention when I see this using public health, using the right data and the right kind of public health informed strategies. If you look on the left side, not everybody got infected. In fact, uh, the airflow in the restaurant actually seems to have determined who is at higher or lower risk of infection. So that's information that we can use. On the, on the right hand side with the blue dots, you see that all the infections are on one side of the workplace, but there are very few infections on the other side where there are walls and barriers and, and um, ways to kind of block the travel of the, the droplet uh, to the other side. So it's not traveling that far in terms of geographic distance. So this speaks to the fact that there are strategies that can help us re-engage in our workplaces in a, in a safer way, which is something that Dr. Knight's going to speak more about. So what kind of challenges are we looking at as we're looking to go forward with the virus? So many of the cases of, uh, of COVID-19 are mild or asymptomatic. It's, you know, a year ago, it wasn't uncommon for people to have a mild illness and go into work or school or, or a public place. And, and so now we have to rethink about what we do when we have symptoms, uh, because we know that many people with COVID could be mild and could transmit to somebody else. Um, we also know that pre-symptomatic transmission is likely, so this couple of days before you start to feel symptoms, you may actually be infectious then. And so that's another important um, thing to pay attention to. And we know that this is a kind of a widespread rapidly spreading pathogen once it takes off. And so this speaks to the importance of using public health strategies and some very kind of old school traditional public health strategies. Things like social distancing, um, contact tracing, quarantine, wearing masks, um, you know, strategies that have been around for hundreds of years in public health. But we have the opportunity now to take the um, modern digital tools that we have available to us, layer that on these more traditional strategies and um, have a better way of, of responding than we ever have in the past. One of the tools that we have been using is transmission models. And so this uh, began, this is an effort uh, that began back in January as um, information started to come out from around the world about COVID-19, uh, at the School of Public Health, a team led by Dr. Marissa Eisenberg, um, Dr. Andrew Brower, were starting to build models about how spread could happen in Washtenaw County and in the state as a whole. And those models have been fundamental in trying to understand how the virus is moving through our communities, but then um, how, and being able to time different interventions as we need that. So one example of the models um, that we've been able to look at is being able to look at what the impacts of social distancing have been to date. How have our strategies helped us in fighting the epidemic so far? And in this graph, this is looking at um, the total cases and the pink is that um, the cases that would have been expected to happen uh, without a stay home, stay safe order, without social broad scale across the board social distancing. Um, and the gray line on the bottom is what actually happened. And um, with these, um, these uh, analyses, this next slide shows this in terms of deaths, what would have happened um, versus what actually happened. The social distancing is, that has been applied is likely resulted in about 3,500 fewer deaths in our state to date. Um, but we know that um, measures like this cause economic, economic devastation, um, particularly if they're in place for too long. And so, um, and that in turn is again, a public health consideration as well. And so our goal next is to work towards strategies that are at, uh, along the lines of that precision population health. How do we make smarter, more refined, um, strategies for intervention without using kind of widespread orders. So we still have work to do going forward, particularly now as more and more people are re-engaging and going out into the general public. Um, you know, one um, example of this I like to show, so this is mobility data. This is data that comes from um, cell phone companies and other public data sources 
uh, that show how people move and interact with each other. And really since uh, the end of April, we see more and more movement in our population, which lets us know that it's time to start preparing and thinking seriously about what kind of measures can be put into place to slow transmission as people begin to move around and, and come out of their homes more frequently. So looking forward um, at, you know, for our next steps, at, at least um, for the, the group of us that focus on surveillance research, is um, we're working in partnership with both the state and with the CDC to continue to build these real-time um, data feeds and these real, this real-time epidemiologic information on the ground, and then couple that with real-time statistical models in a way that allows us to build um, a better system for learning about what, um, what is going on on the ground and to anticipate the information that we're going to need to know as vaccines become available, to know how do we target those vaccines and, and how, do we, um, how do we monitor how well vaccines are working as people start to take them, just, just like we've um, done for influenza for, for many years. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to Dr. Sharon Cardia, who's going to talk more about the digital tools. Thank you, Emily. So when we started to work with the governor's task force on Michigan's economic recovery, one of the very first things that they asked us to tackle was how do we know when the state is transitioning from uncontrolled growth to persistent spread to flattening and beyond? Uh, this meant that we spent a lot of time working with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity to really think through, um, you know, what were these epidemic triggers and transitions, how to keep workplaces safe, what kind of travel restrictions or um, what kind of, you know, size of gatherings would be okay at different stages. And much of this work ended up in the state's safe start plan in different places and in different ways and um, many thanks to all the faculty, Emily Martin, Marissa Eisenberg, Rick Neitzel, um, who are major players in helping the state sort of navigate this. Um, here is just a, one example of the kind of work that we were doing to help the state think through things. So this is a table of epidemic indicators that we use to go over the progress being made across the state. Um, it has eight rows, each representing a different region, a Merck region, so that's the Michigan Economic Recovery Council regions. It really actually is a region defined both by labor shed, where people live and work, as well as the emergency preparedness regions that are public health regions. Um, each column is an indicator and those indicators are used to look at both things like case density. So we have absolute cases per million, weekly trends in cases, and then whether or not there's been a case surge, something that sort of indicates there might be an outbreak. There's also um, an important look at weekly trends in deaths. That's one of the lagging indicators of an epidemic, but it's an important one to continue to look at because it might mean something about um, healthcare system overwhelm. But then we also wanna pay attention to the test results, the percent of tests that are positive or the trend in those positive tests and, and clearly also the number of tests that are being done. And these are mostly in a per million so that we can equalize across all regions, even those that are semi-small or those that are quite large in their population. Um, the colors represented here map onto the colors of the Safe Start Plan. And if you look at them across at each region, you'll notice there's multiple colors represented. This is not an easy thing to determine what state a particular region is in. Is it in medium risk, high risk? Is it flattening or improving? And so um, this always becomes one of the, the key decision points. If you've got good data, you can make good uh, inferences. So um, one of the most significant things that I think we did for the state was convince our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services and Labor and Economic Opportunity that the alignment between preparedness regions and labor sheds would allow the state to open up 
different regions at different times. No other state really had this kind of ability or mindset. And we could do that if two things would happen that really met with precision health, um, I'll call it uh, strategies. One is if we could pull together data in a real time, um, make it visual so many people could look at it in the decision making process and then give basically that framework in such a way that those decisions could be made and executed um, to really sort of save lives or to improve, for instance, economic uh, life within different regions. These eight regions um, represent a, a pretty unique and important way in which the state can, can open up or close down specifically without having to um, close down the whole state, for instance. One of the um, you know, ways that we had to sort of think through getting this information came from um, knowing that dashboards are often used as a great way to illustrate information. So we thought through the details, contacted our School of Information colleagues, and then decided on basically two dashboards, one that is public that anybody could see because you want employers or you want everyday people to be able to see these indicators, but then also local public health and state public health officials to be able to actually get even finer grained information about what was happening within their regions. Uh, to take a quick look at the data, for instance, in some of our um, really important regions like the Detroit metro area, what you can see is just how amazingly far we've come. So just in eight weeks, going from a very high risk of over 200 cases per million per day, so this is daily cases, down now into the medium risk, and we really think that they're approaching the low risk profile for that daily case indicator, which is just an amazing trajectory, and I think real testimony to the way that the state has been um, using the stay at home, uh, stay safe plans. Grand Rapids has a bit of a different trajectory. So it saw its highest levels somewhere in the May, you know, first two weeks. And amazingly, just within a short period of time, they're also transitioning quite quickly down into medium high and then we think medium risk for this particular region that saw kind of a late uh, growth in cases. While Getting nearly real-time data on confirmed cases is kind of the backbone of the current dashboard. Um, we knew that it was going to be essential to try to get even a little bit more ahead of that as um, things opened up and people went back to work. Um, we we're pretty nervous that as people go back to work that new cases would come. And so we suggested to the Department of Health and Human Services that we really needed a way to detect early outbreaks by looking at symptoms. Um, working with them through the concept, um, I then approached our College of Engineering colleagues to build the My Symptoms Tracker using the CDC profiles of symptoms and um, making this available to both the public and to employers and employees so that we really could get kind of real-time symptom monitoring as the precursor of full-blown, I'll call it COVID cases. Um, we think that this gives us about a five or six day lead in front of somebody typically getting sick enough that they want to test. And so applying some of the modeling, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how do we identify these hotspots? Uh, this gives us even a little bit more of an edge in order for local public health to go into workplaces or communities and be able to help people get tests and to um, identify whether or not they do have an early outbreak. Um, in particular, from a sort of basic public health perspective, there's three major benefits here. This hotspot detection, we also put into the app a sort of self-isolation guidance for individuals that are showing symptoms. We made it easy for them to 
on the app, identify testing sites near them, and to provide encouragement for them to get testing if they actually have symptoms that put them at risk or make them look as if they have COVID-like illnesses. Um, the My Symptoms web app has only really been live a couple of weeks, and we currently have over a thousand businesses that are using it. Um, something like 15,000 people have signed up, and we haven't really done much except a press release or, uh, um, you know, some things on the government website, the Contain COVID website of the state. And we're making a huge, I think, um, inroads just in our understanding of what employers and employees need. Uh, this does fulfill the executive order for health screening for employees and employers. And it also lets employees know that they are at risk and what they should do. Um, to sort of take you to the next phase of this, as the new symptom data is coming in and we're able to see who is at risk, um, we're gonna use some mapping that has been developed by one of our faculty members, John Zellner. Um, here is just a little snapshot. He builds hexagonal geographical maps. This allows us to see case density. We'll use the same thing for symptoms that um, show people that are have COVID-like illness and we can scale it at different sizes. So I believe this is 25 kilometer sided hexagons and you can go to 10 kilometer and you can go to one kilometer. So we'll put on the um, public side sort of county level, but then on the public health professional or official side, we'll let them drill down to much finer grain so that they actually have more information so they can go into workplaces or communities and, and help people that seem to have a flare up of these symptoms. Um, we're doing a lot of work, um, sort of, I'll call it all at once. So I have a pretty big next step slide that is kind of our wish list of things, adding this hotspot detection for local public health, adding a better employer portal so that they can see the results of the data that's coming in from their employees in a very usable way. Um, doing the county level symptom monitoring um, addition to the dashboard, adding some forecast modeling. So some of the things that Emily Martin showed that Marissa Eisenberg had done, we're hoping to make that public. Um, we also are starting to work on using some of the data on cases to identify communities hardest hit. Uh, understanding where the health disparities come from and how to actually assist them if a second wave happens. And then clearly there's a need for um, a systematic alerting of public health officials. And we've done a little bit of that um, for trends. And we also wanna do that for early detection. On the My Symptoms web app, uh, we're doing um, a different kind of work where we're thinking through things like how do we make this available to community service organizations or agencies, um, finding other ways to give back to employers and employees, and then uh, translating into different languages for, for Michigan um, citizens. And so now I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Neitzel. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, so I'll be spending the next few minutes um, discussing the opportunity that was presented to us to better understand and identify ways to mitigate risk in workplaces in Michigan. And so early on in the pandemic, we were tasked basically with uh, coming up with an objective method to evaluate what risk might be present in different workplaces across our very economically diverse state. And so we came up with a basically grouping of three different factors, the interactions between workers and other workers or the public, uh, the character characteristics of workplaces where people are employed, and also very importantly, some characteristics about the workers themselves. And so you can see here, uh, we have highlighted in um, orange circles, the different 
factors uh, within each of these groupings. So again, interactions with the general public, physical contact between coworkers, the sharing of tools or machinery, uh, workplace characteristics like required travel, density of workers, whether the work is indoor or outdoor, uh, the airflow in buildings, the availability of sanitation facilities. So those top eight circles that I've just gone through are things that we can potentially modify uh, through mis risk mitigation practices. We have to acknowledge that workers themselves have underlying risk factors, and you can see a few of them uh, listed here. We can't directly influence those, but we absolutely have to be aware of them. So again, we had this opportunity to develop an objective rating system to evaluate these uh, eight worker interaction and workplace characteristics. And so starting from scratch, we developed this uh, objective system, which allows us basically to classify workplaces on each of these factors as being high risk or medium risk or low risk or minimal risk. And we also developed a weighting strategy, which you can see in the right hand column here of high or low, basically reflecting the fact that not each of these factors are equally weighted. Some of them are much more important in terms of infection risk uh, compared to others. So I'll show you an example here of the application of this tool we developed uh, for the state and a tool that indeed has been taken up by the University of Michigan to inform its reopening. And so if we consider commercial construction by these eight factors, you can see that in some cases, for example, physical interaction with the general public, commercial construction has a low rating. On the other hand, commercial construction, you can see the one red box in here for high risk has a lot of shared uh, tooling and equipment. And so applying this tool to a single economic sector or a type of workplace, we can identify the likely infection risk uh, associated with that workplace. And so early on, we identified commercial construction, as you can see, as medium risk. Now we can apply this tool, uh, which is designed to be very broadly applicable to all of the economic sectors and industry and workplace types in the state of Michigan. And so what you're looking at here were our risk estimates for um, uh, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission prior to any mitigation. And if you look at the top three rows here, you'll see low density office work, lab research, and outdoor research without mitigation are really the only three types of work that qualify as low risk. Risk. So pre-mitigation, only about 14% of the uh, workforce in Michigan would be considered low risk. And we have all these other um, uh, types of work to consider uh, all the way up to K through 12 schools, which we would consider highest risk. Now, the good news here is we have a framework, something called the hierarchy of controls that actually allows us to identify risk mitigation practices and order them in terms of priority and likelihood of succeeding. So I'll run you through this quickly. At the top of the hierarchy of controls, we use elimination. Now, unfortunately, elimination is probably not going to happen until if and when we have a vaccine. That's not a short term solution. So moving down the list here, we come to, for example, engineering controls. These are practices we can adopt to actually modify physically the configuration of the workplace to prevent people from coming into contact with uh, the virus. So for example, installing shields and barriers like you've probably seen at uh, grocery stores um, recently, uh, access control, screening at the workplace uh, entrance. We can move down a little further to administrative controls. These are behavioral changes, so requiring workers to do the work in a different way. Things like requiring hand washing, requiring physical distancing of at least six feet uh, between coworkers or coworkers in the public. Uh, and last and least, we come to something called personal protective equipment, PPE. This would be face coverings, masks, respirators. We put this last, not because those things are ineffective, but because they rely on individuals to know how and when and where to use those um, types of protective equipment safely. So the hierarchy of controls are great, but the thing we've added here is what we'll call stacked practices. And this is basically acknowledging that we're going to be safer from infection, the more of these defenses we have in place. So ideally, we stack engineering controls on top of administrative controls, and we still require PPE. By stacking those things, we're going to reduce the infection risk as far as possible. So what happens when we apply these risk mitigation strategies to an industry? Let's return to commercial construction here. So if you look in the right-hand column, you can see different types of mitigation strategies that are appropriate for all eight of these risk factors. And in implementing these, a commercial construction site 
can transition from medium risk down to low risk. And so the good news is we have a whole suite of tools available to us to reduce risk that are applicable to all our diverse economic sectors. And again, the good news here is after mitigation, assuming companies um, do the right thing and follow mitigation plans, we believe that we've moved about 80% of the Michigan workforce into the low risk group. I will say I've had an opportunity to work directly with the state government, but I've also happened, had an opportunity to review over a dozen uh, economic sector specific reopening plans that laid out uh, all of the uh, strategies and tactics that would be used. And I've been quite impressed with those. So again, the good news is post mitigation, we are able to move the vast majority of the workforce into a low risk environment, not no risk, but low risk. And I'll end by saying this is not the end of our challenges. In fact, I'm actively uh, searching for funding now to do things like evaluating compliance. It's great if a company says they're doing the right thing, but are they? We know that there's good companies and bad companies. We also need to consider what are the effectiveness uh, of our risk mitigation strategies and of our assessment tool itself. This was created from scratch. It will certainly evolve as time goes on. We also very much want to identify what are best practices that we can learn and then spread out to other industries so everyone has access to uh, the best and most effective possible protections. And so with that, I will turn the program over to Dean Bowman. Terrific. Thank you, Rick. Uh, and Okay, terrific. So uh, thanks to, to Rick and uh, also to uh, Emily Martin and Sharon Cardia. Hopefully uh, the participants, you feel like you've, you've learned a lot about what the School of Public Health uh, is doing on behalf of, of Michigan residents. And although our efforts with the state will continue, a small working group uh, at the University of Michigan uh, has shifted focus to providing expertise to plan for a public health informed in-person fall semester right on the University of Michigan campus. And, and this work started uh, uh, with outreach from President Schlissel and he came and charged a committee that, that, that I'm chairing uh, at the university with exploring the ways that we could create a, a safer, healthier environment that also maintain the world-class educational uh, experience that many alumni uh, on this call, in, in, including myself, have benefited from. And so on the screen, you can see the guiding principles that we've used for, for this work. And it, you know, at the, at the top, it's prioritizing the health and safety of all members of uh, the University of Michigan community with, with special thought and consideration toward uh, more vulnerable uh, populations. And so that sort of underscores all of our, our, our work along with the other guiding principles that, that, that are listed. Sorry, I was, I was, uh, it looks like I, advance too quickly. So as I, I, I can really wrap up rather than spending time to uh, get to the to the final graphic, but what I'd say in terms of the work by the university uh, that the work is, is really following uh, a couple of approaches. One is that we're trying to uh, focus on building resilience through a series or collection of testing, containment strategies uh, like quarantine and contact tracing, and, and thirdly, monitoring, and that these activities are paired or coupled with uh, a set of stacked practices as just described by Dr. Neitzel to build our adaptability uh, to create a, a, an environment with mitigated risks and as we uh, pursue just the various types of academic activities that, that, that we have on campus. And the university leadership is considering uh, a set of recommendations from our com uh, committee 
and uh, we'll you know, be staying tuned to determine how we'll move forward in, in the fall. Uh, but at, what I would like to communicate to you, and we'll be happy to answer some questions that have started to come in uh, at an appropriate level of detail for now, but I, I will assure you being steeped in this work that we are taking you know, every uh, effort available in using the breadth of expertise available at the university to not only really uh, arrive at a decision for what we will do in the fall, but, but, but how we'll do so and ensuring in an ongoing way that we have all of the measures in place to, uh, to, that are most protective and that, that mitigate risk across the, the institution. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude. We have a few moments left to be able to uh, take some questions. So I will take a look at some questions and then uh, try to point out the appropriate panelists to, to answer the questions. So the first question, uh, has the University of Michigan at least tentatively decided to reopen in the fall? If so, what kinds of mitigation measures will need to be imposed in order to ensure a successful reopening? And we've alluded to some of those. At this point, again, no official decision has been made. I am uh, sort of cautiously optimistic uh, about the prospects for opening in the fall, but I imagine in the coming uh, weeks, uh, probably next couple of weeks, that a, a, an official decision will be made, but, but again, not only the decision, but with an understanding of a range of strategies that, that will take uh, to reduce risk across the, uh, the university. Uh, another question compared to the time necessary to promulgate effective treatments and or a vaccine, how soon are we likely to be able to achieve herd immunity for COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Martin, do you wanna take that question? Sure. Um, you know, it's gonna be a while, unfortunately. Uh, you know, with a virus with, uh, with an R-naught or an effective R, which is what we call how fast the spreads, a virus that spreads this quickly, um, the, the herd immunity threshold is probably in the neighborhood of 60 to 80%. And so a lot of people have to be infected for that before that to happen. Now, with a virus like flu or rhinovirus or even the other coronaviruses that we see every year, we don't worry about that as much. But with a virus that has this level of um, mortality associated with it, uh, we worry about that level of herd immunity that's required quite a bit. And so what I think most of us can expect to see at least some level of mitigation practices that stay in place uh, until we have either a quick treatment or, or a vaccine. Thank you. Um, Dr. Martin, another one for you. Uh, compared to surrounding states, Michigan had a worse experience. Do you know why? Was it delay uh, in, in at-home orders? And what I would like to do is extend the question, I'll take the liberty of doing that, and talking not only about how the state of Michigan was impacted early uh, uh, relative to surrounding states, but what the experience has also been by way of some of the uh, intervention measures that have been taken uh, by the governor. So Michigan was hit um, hard and hit early. I, you know, there's a lot of different theories about why Michigan was hit as hard as it was. One of them might be just the interconnectedness of Michigan, the Detroit area, we don't think of our other, I think other people around the country don't think of us as like an LA or a Seattle or a New York, but we actually are very interconnected in this region. And so that, that might have um, contributed to us getting hit early. Unfortunately, with this pandemic, getting hit early meant that we got hit when there was very little testing available, very little contact tracing on the ground in place, like very little ability to use our tools. And so that meant using, um, you know, stay at home orders and, and um, social distancing as quickly as possible to um, prevent the hospitals from getting overloaded. So we've, um, we used those, I think, as quickly as it made sense to. 
Um, and they've stayed in place for longer than other states. And interestingly, if you see the last couple of days of data, last week of data, we've started to see a lot of rises in our in neighboring states and other states around the country. And Michigan continues to go down, which I think speaks to the responsiveness of our population in Michigan and the responsiveness of our residents in doing those hard mitigation um, strategies to try to get the virus back down. So. Terrific. Uh, Dr. Cardia, uh, will the app uh, developed for the state be used by the university uh, and the student population? So right now we're, um, we're looking actually at a smart app for the university. Um, the My Symptoms app, we've had actually universities from across the country ask us to demo it and so I actually think it might be used at some other universities, both in Michigan and um, across the country. But I think actually, if we're going to go back to school in person, we probably need something that um, has more than what is just symptoms in order for us to keep track of um, things like who's tested or um, you know, being able to give kind of real time information to people. So um, it had been my hope that we would use it. We'll use elements of it, but we won't use, I think, the, the My Symptoms app at the U of M. There's, an, there's another question uh, asking, is there any work being done or planned to address mental health impact on return to work efforts? And uh, what I'll say is this, uh, it, this has been a central component to discussions and planning efforts at the university. Uh, the university, even prior to the pandemic, has done, in my view, uh, an excellent job of bolstering its uh, mental health resources and capacity, having, in many cases, not only central resources at the university, but embedded uh, counselors at, at within the schools and colleges. And so uh, I, I think that will serve as a, as a wonderful foundation, but will be further sort of amplified to, to, to meet the anticipated uh, demand that we'll see in the fall semester and beyond. And in addition, what I'll say is something that started actually in the winter 2020 uh, semester that uh, additional services were put in place for uh, the relatively small number of students who were uh, who did test positive or or were exposed to people who did test positive and so there was this wonderful support system and structure set up around them uh, students who let's say had to quarantine uh, with some uh, wellness checks and food delivery and other things like that so we are thinking about mental health and sort of complementary uh, services for, for, for campus. So, um, some other questions as I scan quickly on, on testing and I, I'll be happy to, to, to take this question as well. Uh, the testing strategy, we won't be able to say any details about the testing strategy because it's still under consideration by university leadership. But just to describe broadly elements of, of sort, sort of a robust testing strategy, uh, first and foremost, widely available uh, point of care testing for anyone who becomes symptomatic uh, and the, the corresponding uh, the, the corresponding contacts of that, of that person. So that's something that I uh, certainly anticipate that we'll have. We'll also explore a set of other uh, testing strategies that could include things just to give e examples of, of things like uh, surveillance testing uh, to give us an idea of the spread on campus, if any, and to, to detect it early. Uh, as well as possibly even uh, some, some arrival protocol. So with that, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. Uh, would like to thank you again for joining us. Hopefully the session was informative for you and we really appreciate all of the, uh, the work that you do and the support that, 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 that you have and continue to provide for, for the University of Michigan. So thank you and good night.
Thank you, Dean Bowman and Professors Cardia, Martin, and Neitzel for sharing your insights and for all that you are doing for our community during this time. I want to especially thank Nicole Rubin for serving as our host today. And thanks to all of you for joining us for our second Victor's Heroes Wolverines event. We appreciate you letting us try something new and staying connected to fellow Wolverines during this time. You'll receive a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this event, a survey, and the slides from today. We ask you to please fill out the information so we can keep you informed about more upcoming sessions. Stay well, stay safe, and forever, go blue.